Thank you very much, Stephen, for this introduction. Welcome, everyone. I want to thank you for having braved the November weather, <laughs> for having shunned the May festival in Brighton events, and for having decided to come here. An inaugural lecture is a ritual. And as anthropologists know and stress, rituals are really important in order to give life to collective life. I tend to lead a rather compartmentalized life. But here today, I have people from many quarters coming. And I'm grateful to that. I'm, of course, grateful to everyone who has made it possible for me to have this position. And I am grateful to everyone who is making my job so enjoyable. So I want to thank my colleagues, my law colleagues at Brighton, my colleagues at the Brighton Business School, people from the social movement research cluster at Brighton and beyond. And also, of course, my students. I see some current students. There are also some former students. And I also see many of my colleagues from Sussex. And you know, it's a great pleasure to be back together with you from law, from, an, from anthropology, from the Justice and Violence Center, and for the from the old European the School of European Studies. These were the days. Thank you also to my local friends and to people who have come from further afield. And thank you for Anna to be here. She's my youngest attendee. And for some friends, even some who have decided that they would celebrate their birthday by coming here. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Elias always says an inaugural is a celebration. So I want to celebrate being here, but in a sense I also want to celebrate having come to this country 30 years ago exactly. That was a very inspired crossing. And being with my wonderful family, 20 years with Bob, First time he gets to hear me speaking in <laughs> public. So, you know, <laughs> it's great. So the date is 6 May 2015. Will we remember it? <coughs> Tomorrow there are elections, national elections, very uncertain future. But one of the things we know is that at least the prime minister at the moment really does not like the Human Rights Act. And actually, he doesn't like the European Convention on Human Rights either. <coughs> Let's listen to what he had to say about... It makes me physically ill to even contemplate having to give the vote to anyone who is in prison. OK, so these are his feelings. His feelings have not, that was in 2010. They've not got better over the years. The, conserva the Conservative Party promises to get rid of the Human Rights Act if they are re-elected. It's a serious matter. It's serious enough that NGOs are waging a huge campaign to alert people about that and to say, we, you, we really need to support the Human Rights Act. I, you will see that I entirely support that, even though my lecture shows problem with the European Convention on Human Rights. My lecture is going to be divided into three parts. The first part will be, is entitled, to get or not to get a convention with teeth. Now, the lawyers know that 
when we have an international legal document, we, we kind of ask whether it has teeth and whether it's biting. And so I was trying to find an image for this lecture, and I thought I would spare you the jaws of the sharks, etc. And from one thing to the next, I decided that I would give you a beautiful watchdog. <laughs> and he's very beautiful, he's quiet, he's not doing anything, and that's what you want from a watchdog. It's there, but it doesn't bite because it doesn't need to. I will also want to talk to you about who was, who is the convention for? Who manages to get the live boy and who is left at sea? And to talk about that, uh, um, I will take the, uh, the figure of the colonial subject, who actually was still very much there in 1950 was when the European Convention on Human Rights was negotiated and agreed, but through various mechanisms left out from protection. And finally, I'll ask what good the convention system is. There is here a, 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 a photograph of applicants. We'll see what happened to them. And my conclusion will be that we need to do the human right thing. OK, so let's move on then to the first part. First part, this watchdog. And what I'm going to do is to try to see what it takes to have a convention with teeth. Well, the first thing you need is to have a signature. You need to have agreements between a number of governments. And so they all are going to meet together, and one representative is going to sign. This is a picture of the actual convention signed in 1950 in Rome. After that, once the representatives go home, the convention needs to be ratified, and that's going to be done through the procedures of each country. Slightly different from one country to the next. I could have put a lot of pictures of um, national parliaments, because it's often there through th done through that in that way. The convention, the ECHR to be biting, also needed to have a court. Now, when it was negotiated, there were some countries which were saying, we need a court. That was France, Italy, Germany, Austria. Other countries, the UK, Netherlands, Sweden, Denmark, were saying, you know, we're happy to have a convention on human rights, but let's not have a court. That's far too dangerous. So a compromise was reached, and they decided that they would have a convention, and within the convention, they would say, each member state to the convention can, if it wishes, declare that it recognizes the jurisdiction of the court for a limited period, one year, three years, five years, and then reconduct or not reconduct. So they did that. It was successful. A court was put together. Not to the liking of everyone, though. So listen to <coughs> the Lord Chancellor of the United Kingdom in 1950, three weeks before the convention is signed. It completely surpasses the wit of man to guess what results would be arrived at by a tribunal composed of elected persons who need not even be lawyers. Any student of our legal institutions must recoil from this document with a feeling of horror. I cannot view with equanimity an appeal to a secret court composed of persons with no legal training, possessing the unfettered right to expound the meaning of 17 articles which may mean anything, or as I hope, nothing. So that was the feeling. So once they had decided they would have a court, they had to decide whether people could go to the court. And that was a big hurdle as well. So they, they decided we're going 
also to make it subject to a declaration of a member state that it agrees that an individual could turn to the Strasbourg system. That worked as well, and so eventually it was, it was possible for some applicants to go. You also need, however, for the convention to really work to, be, to come domestically. In this country, it's typically the Human Rights Act, but it goes further than that, because really it's the whole culture that you need to talk about, like my colleague Barbara Oman does in, in this book. <laughs> so what it takes for the ECHR to bite, I've just told you, signature ratification, court, individual petition, domestic implementation. If you don't have the signature, the rest falls off. If you have a signature, maybe you won't have a ratification. Then the rest falls off. If you have the signature, there are all kinds of possibilities. Maybe you're going to ratify and recognize the court at the same time, but not grant the right of individual petition, or grant it afterwards. As for what happens domestically, everything is possible. So one more thing I want to say is that with Protocol 11 to the Convention, it came about that it was decided that once you have a signature and a ratification, automatically the court would be recognized and there would be a right of individual petition. So that is the system since 1998. And basically, that closes part one, except that I want to talk about this beautif beautiful dog a little bit. The dog has teeth, but hopefully will never need to bite. Just like the core would be there, but it would never need to do anything. That was the aim in 1950. We'll have a court, but everything will be all right. Certainly the dog should not turn against his master. It's there to keep away those who do not behave, but of course it's not us, it's others. And in fact, this picture of the book I have shown you, it's exactly saying that. It was right for others in the Netherlands. Sounds familiar? Well, it was the same in the UK, the same idea. Now, finally, the dog can be trained, and it must be obedient. And if it's not obedient, then you can put it away. Maybe you can even eliminate it physically. And I think that also has resonance with what's happening at the moment. So I want to turn to part two, then. And this is about asking, who was the convention for? And if we ask that, we need to ask, well, who did it and why? What were, was the aim of the convention? The aim of the convention was to try to make it possible that something like World War II would never happen again. So that was the number one consideration. It's beginning to be negotiated in 1949. But there was another consideration, and that was that the Cold War was, being, was beginning to set to end. There was a big fear that the Communist Party would take over, especially in France, but also in Italy. Now, I'm going to give you a number of pictures. Look at them and think about who is negotiating the convention. Look who is there and here. And then 
This is the early days. The Council of Europe gets established in 1949, a little bit afterwards. The convention is signed. They had an extra hurdle. You would not go directly to the court. You first go to the convention, to the, co to the European Commission of Human Rights, not to be mixed up with the Commission of the European Committees of the European Union. But here is an early picture of the Commission. This is the court, the court again. So there are a number of people you have not seen on these pictures, and this gives you one clue. <laughs> there were women, and they were very useful, but their interest and concerns were not the primary consideration of what was going on. You could say, nor of the poor, nor of the use, nor of the disabled, nor, of course, of the colonial subject. So let's listen to a member of the UK government speaking in July 1950. The bulk of the people in most colonies are still politically immature, and the essence of good government among such people is respect for one single undivided authority. The right of petition to an international body would obscure this principle. The resulting confusion would undoubtedly be exploited by extremist politicians in the colonies. Loyalty would be shaken. Administration would be made more difficult and agitation more easy. Okay, so there was not... From this, you cannot really see a very much an appetite to extend the convention to the colonial subjects, although publicly it was said human rights is, of course, for everybody. So what I want to look at with you is ways to which it was possible to do as if the convention was for everybody, but managing not to make it for everyone. I first want to say this was a very important issue in 1949-1950. Decolonization was not there yet. So there were still colonies. I don't know how many of you here know about this picture. Does anybody know what it is? There are no Belgians amongst you. Because if you look, you see Belgium. As a child, I learned that our king had made the most beautiful gift it could to the Belgians. It had given a whole country complete with its population, with its people, and that was such a wonderful gift. I also learned that the Congo was 80 times the size of Belgium, which is which you have there. So what I want to say, 1950, nobody thinks that decolonization <coughs> is around the corner. In 1955, a law professor puts forward the idea that we should have a plan to go beyond colonialism and have at least some kind of autonomy for the Congolese within 30 years. That is a complete shock. You know, 30 years, that would have meant 1985. Um, so in, in 1950, there, there are colonies. So what do the colonial powers do who won this convention but don't want it? Well, first of all, the Belgians say, you know what? We're going to say that the convention applies with due reg regard to local requirements. So, you know, the Congolese are like children. Obviously, they cannot be treated like full adults, so they're not going to have the same rights as everybody. Or they will have the same rights, but we will apply them with distinction. The Belgian idea was accepted. <coughs> then the British came up and said, well, you know, in our system, we cannot just give a convention to everyone. 
there is indirect rule. These, con these territories must choose for themselves. We cannot impose the convention on them. So they said, what we're going to do is to say that there can be a declaration which extends the provisions of the convention to territories. That was accepted as well. But actually, even that was not quite enough. So they invented something else, which was on top of that, for, the, for a colonial subject to be able to rely on the convention, there would need to be a special, uh, an extra declaration, which was saying that individuals could apply. And so this became Article 63 of the ECHR, which you don't see it because the slide is slightly different, but the last one is uh, paragraph four. In practice, there were four colonial powers at the time. They all signed the convention in 1950. Having signed it, the UK was very good and took it on board, so ratifies in 1951. Then it even makes a declaration to extend to its colonies in 1950. I think it's 53. But then it waits until 1966 to grant the right of individual petition and to recognize the jurisdiction of the court in the United Kingdom. And that is because there is still a fear, even though it would not have extended the right of individual petition to the colonies, that it, oh, one didn't know what was going to happen. But in 1966, the empire had dwindled. It was comprised 3.5 million, says Brian Simpson, who has written this masterpiece, Human Rights and Empire. And so they do come to make a 63-4 declaration a little bit later. So that, that is an interesting story. And then after that, the British authorities, the British government becomes angry at Strasbourg at regular intervals and say, you know, these declarations, we're not going to reconduct them. But then they do. And then in 1998, it becomes part of the convention system anyway. And now we are where we are, we, where, with obviously a government which is saying we want to backtrack. The Belgians, what do they do? They sign, they ratify in 1955, so quite late. I think that's the 11th country to do that. Immediately after that, they accept the right of individual petition and the, re, the, re, the, the court, but they never do anything about their colonies. That's it, the colonies are left out. The Netherlands ratifies in 1954, recognizes the court at the same time, extends to the colonies a little bit later, grants individual petition, and even does a 63-4 declaration. So different scenarios, you know, for different member states deciding within their own domestic politics what they want to do. The French, you remember how much they were saying there is no point of having a court, uh, of having a convention which does not have a court. So, you know, they were there pushing. They signed in 1950, <laughs> they ratified in 1974, at which case, they, at which time they also decide to accept the right of individual petition. But I decided not to put when they were going to recognize the court because it would have changed all my timeline for the slide. But that happened in 1981 when Francois Mitterrand came, uh, became president. And the reason for that, all commentators agree, was the, problem, the, pro the, the colonial problem. Um, so there you go. OK, so you could ask, why am I spending so much time talking about the colonial subject? 
you could say, well, it's because she's done her doctorate and he's <laughs> it's her first monograph, and which is partly true. But I want this picture was given to me by one of my informants. He is on tour. He's a colonial administrator. He's on tour um, visiting the Bruce. That is 1951, this picture. So it is after the convention was signed. And I think that's interesting. So what I want to insist upon is what I hope I've shown you is that there is a way of getting away from the biting teeth of the convention. If this could be done in, rega in regard to the colonial subject, which was, it was such an oxymoron. They were just saying human rights is for everyone, and then they exclude millions of people. It can be done in many different ways. So the morale, we need to be careful and to watch how well the watchdog is given the means to protect. You could say it happened a long time ago. We don't mind any longer. Colonialism was a phenomenon of such magnitude that, of course, the repercussions are still here today. We, should, we cannot just turn the page. It was too big. So I think that's a second reason to um, talk about it today. And then, finally, of course, the colonial subject of yesteryear then became the migrant of the 1960s and 70s, 80s. And admittedly, we are now in an era of super diversity in the field of migration. Still, we cannot understand the Strasbourg case law related to migration today without understanding the Strasbourg case law related to the migrants of the 1980s. And we cannot understand that case law without understanding how the colonial subject was approached, which is why you have got this long story so far. So moving on then. So I now want to ask what good the convention system. And I want to take this, this picture. You know, you have applicants. I think they look rather joyful. I think in this group of people, I assume that um, there are the three applicants who uh, in the first case, which was decided by the European Court of Human Rights in a migrant matter, and that was in 1985, which in itself is amazing, because the court was established in 1959. So for more than, for, for over 25 years, you have no migrant case which manages to make it to Strasbourg. And then finally, you have this case. And these three women were saying that they were settled legally in the United Kingdom, and they wanted to be joined by their husband, who was also a foreigner. And they were pre their husband could not join them. And they were saying to the court, this is a violation of our right to family life. The court responded, no, no, no. There is no problem under the convention because you can conduct family life wherever you like. If you like, go somewhere else. You'll be with your husband. So the conclusion is that there is no right to family reunion under the European Convention on Human Rights with very small <coughs> exceptions. But they are very small. I found this picture in a book which was celebrating the 50th <coughs> anniversary of the European Court of Human Rights, which is interestingly entitled The Conscience of Europe. The caption for this photograph in this book is that the court 
heard the case in 1984, the court held that the applicants had been victims of discrimination on the ground of sex in the enjoyment of their right to respect for family life, which is true because if these women had been men, they could have been joined by their wives. But because they were women, they could not be joined by their husband. So the court said there is here a discrimination on the ground of sex. We cannot tolerate this. The result of which was that the UK had to eliminate the discrimination. How did it do that? By making it difficult for all foreigners, men and women, to be joined by their spouse. Another thing which nonetheless interests me is this caption. Because you don't, nobody says there is no right to family reunion. The right that the applicants managed to get was useless. In all respects, it was useless. But the fact that the right which would have been helpful to them was not granted is not, almost you could say, is not remembered. With this kind of case law being established, it became, the, the, the most common case that expulsion would be regarded as being acceptable. So if you have a second generation migrant, 20 year old who begins to be um, uh, involved in some criminal offenses, he can be expelled. It's not always the case, but it's generally what happens. The exceptions are numerically limited. Why? Well, you know, if there is a family life to be conducted, it, pin it can be conducted elsewhere. It doesn't need to be in this particular country. A return to torture under the European Convention on Human Rights is always prohibited. That's an absolute prohibition. You can never return someone to a real risk of torture or inhuman and degrading treatment. There is a problem, however, for most applicants, and that is that they need to evidence the risk of torture. It's not always easy to prove that you've been tortured in the, in the past. If you have scars, the authorities can say, oh, we think it's because you fell one day. So, or it's not always easy to say, well, once you're going to be back in this country, you're going to be tortured. It might not be accepted. So in fact, in fact, there are a lot of exceptions. Most people don't manage to persuade the court that they actually have a good case. Now, to me, one of the most disturbing uh, principle of the Strasbourg migrant case law is that there is no right to fair trial guarantees in immigration matters. That means that if you say you do not have a residence permit, or you say that you, you feel that you should have been granted refugee status, but you have not, or you say that you should, your children should be able to join you, or whatever you say, if it's an immigration matter, you have no right under the convention to have to have your dispute heard by an independent judge with legal representation. If I have a problem with my employer, I have a right to go to court with fair trial guarantees. For most of the problems that we encounter, criminal or civil, we have a right to fair trial guarantees, not under the convention. Did you hear that? <laughs> it's doors closing. It's a slamming of the door. And I'm putting this here 
because I think it's really important to realize that this case of 2001 called Maouya, which many, even ECHR experts, don't know about. I came across a doctoral student who had done all her thesis on uh, immigration issues. She had never heard of Maouya. Because lawyers don't talk about rights that don't exist. We talk about rights which exist. But of course, in terms of the migrants, it's absolutely devastating. There is no right for their issue to have to be heard in a court of law. No right to work under the convention. If you are being told that you cannot work, well, that's it, not a problem under the convention. No right to a particular residence permit. That is outside the convention. And detention, when it's for immigration purposes, need not be a last resort. If suddenly I am being taken away and my liberty is limited, it has to be because it's really needed. Maybe you know I'm suspected of a crime, or I've become mad, or I'm completely drunk, or I am a risk to myself or to others. But it has to be necessary and proportionate. Immigration detention, according to the court, and that was confirmed in 2008, it can be for administrative convenience. You can detain an asylum seeker so that it's easier to process his or her application. OK, I've gone very quickly through that. So if you are interested, <laughs> it's all in my book. Now, if you are interested but don't want the book, you can even go to my blog where I talk of, I, 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 I have short um, episodes of, on, of podcast. There is another thing on that slide is that you can see that the title is that the Inter-American Court takes a different approach. I think it's very important to realize that human rights law needs not be as it is in Europe. There is another possibility. Now, in my book, chapter 13 is entitled The Darkest Case Law. There are many stateless people in Europe. There are millions of stateless people in Europe. Some of these stateless people have no right to be where they are. They do not have a residence permit. If they do not have a residence permit, it means they cannot work legally. It also means they cannot access benefits. They're not recognized as a person who should have the means of livelihood. It seems to me that from a human rights perspective, there is hardly something more poignant than this situation, at least for a lawyer. I mean, this is about denying the right to have rights, to use the expression coined by Anna Arendt. In cases of this kind, the European Court of Human Rights has said, actually, this does not engage the convention. It's outside the convention. There is no problem under the convention with that situation. And what I say, you don't see it very well, but I say this kind of conclusion, which is really difficult to, to stomach, is the logical outcome of the case law I was talking to you about previously. That case, Bonger, that I cite, it's even less well known than Maouya. At least Maouya is a grand chamber judgment, so you would have some people knowing about it. Bonger, it's an inadmissibility decision 
I expect, I mean, I cannot say that for sure, but I, am, I expect that <coughs> I must be one of the first academics to, to talk about it. So, this has appeared recently. Uh, I sometimes wonder whether this is a cartoon which one should send to the judges of the European Court of Human Rights to remind them that the meaning of human rights is that everybody has equal worth and dignity. Now, I should not go too far in my criticism of the European Court of Human Rights, because actually, I say that, but I'm very well aware that there are some judges who work very hard at trying to get the kind of case law that I would wish it to have to, to be there. Suddenly, after I put my poster together, um, the, the, the issue of illegal migrants dying in the Mediterranean became first page news. The European Court of Human Rights has not dealt with these <coughs> with cases of death, as far as I know. There has been one case about interception at sea, and so having migrants coming from Libya, being intercepted by the Italian authorities and directly brought back to Libya. In 2012, in the case of Irsi, the court found a number of very important violations of the convention, having to do with the fact that these people were unable to claim asylum, uh, it was a collective expulsion, uh, it was inhuman and degrading. There were all kinds of things being found. And so in that sense, it's a, it's a judgment which has been celebrated and found groundbreaking. And that's true. At the same time, at the end of the judgment, when it comes to the reparations, the court says to the Italian authorities, to the Italian government, which is the defendant state, you know what? To implement this judgment, you should obtain assurances from the Libyan authorities. This is like, this is the way to implement the judgment. You should make sure, ask the Libyan authorities, tell them, please do not hurt the applicants. And then everything will be fine. There was one dissenting opinion in that judgment by a judge who was saying, well, there was only one way to implement the judgment, and it was to say that the applicants could return to Italy and could have their claim to asylum being uh, examined there. Possibly, it's not surprising that the court would not do that. Obviously, everybody knows that the states would hate it. But what are the implications of the court not doing that? I couldn't help putting this new picture of a German shepherd. In French, we say that it's a dog qui fait le beau. And then I was wondering, what, how does that translate into English? <coughs> and I found that it means to sit up and beg. And I think there is a question mark as to whether sometimes <coughs> the European Court of Human Rights is not really too sub subservient to the states. Um, and I mean, another thing which I will love to explore now that I am at the Brighton Business School is the relationship with corporations. Having said this, at the moment, I think what we need to do is really, is really, it's not, it's, it, it's to say, okay, what we need is one, to keep the Human Rights Act in this country, but two, to have 
a strong European Convention on Human Rights and a strong European Court of Human Rights. So despite all the problems that I have mentioned, I think there is still a lot of uh, uh, promise in that system. And so what we need to do is to support it rather than to annihilate it. So what remains for me to do now is to give some credit. Uh, I have I received a lot of pictures from the European Court of Human Rights and from the Council of Europe. And it's fantastic the way that staff there is always facilitating my research. I also want to mention, I don't know if any has recognized who was talking when we had these quotes from the 1950s, but it's my neighbor or our neighbor, Simon. So thank you to Simon. And last but not least, I really want to thank Bob and Ellis, because without them, this PowerPoint would not have happened. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your attention.